All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, inst installation or inst installment <laughs> of the Chrono Developer Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's go ahead and get this uh, going here. So real quick agenda. Uh, I got quick announcements, product ideas, and then status updates for today. All right. So announcements. The next Chrono Developer Meeting will be in two weeks on December 18th. The next Switch Developer Meeting will be uh, on December 11th. Um, the next two meetings are December 25th and January 1st, right? I should say the next two Mondays are December 25th and January 1st. So, uh, yeah, I think we're going to skip those, <laughs> um, which I guess would put us then the, the one after that on January 8th. So I think what we'll probably do um, is start out with the current uh, developer meeting on uh, January 8th, but um, we'll see. I'll send out a... Uh, a message beforehand <clears throat> so everybody's on the same page um but yeah moving on to the rest of this so product ideas i've talked about this uh before haven't added any new ideas to this if anyone has any comments or questions about any of these feel free to ask i could certainly go into more detail if any of these look interesting i have talked about this before so if you're interested go take a look at the uh recordings all right so moving on to the status updates um, I think the main points, I've been doing a lot of work on the PTP subsystem. Um, a couple of bugs were discovered recently while trying to get everything all cleaned up and committed um, to the you know main upstream repository. So it took some time to get those bugs fixed. Um, so there's a couple of things that I was uh, chipping away at as well that uh, have been included in the, uh, in the upstream repository changes, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, then I also did some work, or the next thing I'm going to be working on is uh, some stuff to support the single hardware interface uh, setup. Basically, um, I think I talked about this previously a little bit in terms of, well, um, what we can do is have the driver software manage splitting one interface into multiple ports, but we need a couple of additional hardware features for that to uh, to work properly. So I'm going to start chipping away at that because I think we need some of this stuff for the um, for the research project at UCSD that's starting to spin up again um, at this point. Um, also, I guess a couple of words on the application section pass through, hopefully, um, and then the uh, the they might remove the development test bed slide. We'll see. It might be there, might not be. <laughs> okay. So new PTP subsystem. Um, so I've talked about this before in the next couple of meetings or in the previous couple of meetings, but uh, the idea is to distribute the PTP hardware clock time via basically a single wire serial connection to other components inside the FPGA. Um, and this allows you to send the time across, you know, multiple SLRs into multiple clock domains and whatnot, uh, wherever you need it, you can have it. Um, and then also the idea is to support using truncated relative timestamps from which the 96-bit timestamps can be reconstructed. So the way it's integrated right now, uh, we have the new hardware clock, we have uh, leaf clocks, which generate both the 96-bit absolute timestamp and the 64-bit relative timestamp. Um, and that's basically just been a drop-in replacement for the old um, hardware clock components. So the next step is to actually do the timestamp reconstruction, which is where you're gonna get the main savings and logic resources and whatnot um, due to you know removing all of those additional um, block RAM bits and whatnot for handling the timestamps. Um, but I did discover a couple of issues in the uh, PTP clock components that I had to fix. So a little bit more details on the next couple of slides um, on you know what those were. Um, but I made a couple of changes to kind of improve the stability of the leaf clocks. And then the other thing I did is I reworked the uh, hardware clock module to add a register around the uh, the shared adder. Um, so it seemed to work pretty well on most of the targets, but uh, I think it was the Intel Agilex ES parts. Uh, they failed timing miserably because of that adder. Why just the ES parts and not the non-ES ones? I don't know. It's only a 48-bit adder, so it's not that big, but um, I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Because even the, because you can get some boards that, uh, that can either come popular with an ES part or a production part. Um, and the ES one would fail timing, the production part would be fine. So it's like, 
very strange. Um, it doesn't help, I think, that the um, that on those boards, uh, it's running that uh, ref clock at about 400 megahertz. So, um, yeah, that doesn't help with timing closure. But I went ahead and added that um, that register, reworked the state machine, and um, now it seems to close timing pretty reliably on the Adlex devices. So that's uh, that's an improvement. All right, so let me go ahead and just real quick talk about the uh, bugs that I bumped into. So first thing, um, just kind of um, informational, I suppose, is that apparently um, the PLLs on at least the Xilinx devices, I haven't checked with the Intel ones yet, but the Xilinx ones, they do not remove PCIe spread spectrum. I think if you need to do that, you probably need an external PLL or something on the ref clock before you pass it into the FPGA. So um, basically what we were seeing is one of the uh, boards that we're using as part of the research project for generating a synchronization signal based off of PTP. It wasn't, it was generating a very erratic signal, um, but it didn't seem to be doing that on every host machine I was testing the card in to try to reproduce it. One of the machines I have here, it, you know, I could reproduce it on a different one. It worked fine. Um, and it turns out that on the one that it worked fine, it had PCIe spread spectrum disabled. And on the other one, it was enabled. Um, so I went ahead and pulled out the um, the PCIe user clock and whacked it up on a spectrum analyzer. And well, sure enough, uh, we can see the approximately 0.5% down spread um, that you get with PCIe spread spectrum. So the my understanding of what it's doing is it's applying basically a, um, a triangle wave of around 30 kilohertz to the um, to the frequency of the of the source, and the amplitude ends up being about 0.5 percent. Now it's a downspread, so the high end is at 200 is at 100 megahertz on the ref clock, and the low end is then I guess 99.5 megahertz. So that ends up being a you know, amplitude of around 5,000 ppm, which is uh, a bit much. Um, and I guess it's causing a couple of problems with the, uh, or I guess not really causing, but exacerbating a couple of uh, issues with the with the leaf clock that I had to get then go and sort out. So yeah, and the VC-108 it had a very nice, uh, convenient pair of SMA connectors that I could just put the clock on and then bring it into the spectrum analyzer to take a look at it. So um, that's what that looks like. So there were two different bugs in the leaf clock that were uh, causing the problem here. The first one is that there was an issue with the logic that um, that synchronizes the captured timestamp from the source clock domain to the destination clock domain as part of driving the uh, control loop. And basically what was happening is that logic was throwing out um, some of the samples and obviously, if you have a control loop and you're not feeding it to the correct error signal in a timely manner, it's not going to work right. Uh, so the loop got out, of, got all out of whack, and that caused the clock to get far enough out of sync that it had to step to get back in sync. So this one was a relatively easy one to fix. This was producing like many step pulses per second and really screwing everything up. So uh, that was not good. Fixed that, uh, but I was still seeing step pulses, but at a much lower rate. And I traced that one to a, um, a race condition in a different part of the synchronization logic. Um, this one is for handling the base of the coarse timestamp synchronization. So there's the, the fine synchronization that's um, basically a digital PLL on the lower nine bits of the timestamp. And then the rest of the timestamp that has to get checked and updated um, just in case somebody changed the, the time basically, or during the, the synchronization process initially. Um, so basically what was happening is that due to a race condition, the data that got received over the serial signal wasn't consumed uh, in a timely manner. So in some cases, as you can see the, uh, the, the these pulses on the valid register here should be about this long, but in some cases they were they were too long. It's basically the mess. The data being received in one message be consumed associated with the following message, which is you know, two hundred fifty six cycles late, and as a result, 
that's going to result in a false uh, loss of uh, lock uh, indication. So thing was basically working. There's nothing wrong with the control loop here necessarily, but it was causing that to uh, generate step pulses and screw up the uh, the sync signal generation. So that one was also relatively easy to fix. Um, I also have a slide normal operation. Uh, this is what it should look like. Well, more or less. I think I still might need to do some tuning because we still have a few little um, probably unnecessary perturbations in the uh, in the synchronization here. But you can see that it is does seem to be tracking the uh, the spread spectrum when the things are uh, somewhat more stable. So yeah, there's probably a few more adjustments that I can make, but at least it's not generating the step pulses anymore. I think I let this run for like 12 hours or 24 hours with the ILA and it didn't trigger at all. So um, I'm going to declare this particular issue as, uh, as being solved. Um, Obviously, you know, there could be some more tuning, but uh, we'll work on that later, probably. All right. So that has all been updated in the uh, in the repository at this point. And I also went ahead and pushed the code up to the uh, upstream repository. So I can't remember the last time I did that. I guess it's probably been, a, you know, at least a couple of months. So um, hopefully there aren't any other major issues there. But if there are, let me know and I'll... Uh, prioritize getting that uh, getting that sorted out. So um, I did make a couple of other changes. Um, there were a couple of bugs related to the address space layout when you have a bunch of ports turned on um, on the same interface. Uh, I fixed that, so that works now. Um, and I also did some work on the transceiver wrappers to enable uh, QPLL sharing. So if you want to run, say, PCI Express and Ethernet on the same um, same quad, uh, you need to bring out a few additional ports so you can hook things up correctly. So um, that should work at this point. I tested it on my uh, ZC106. I don't know if the Ethernet ports work because I don't have a way of, of connecting them to the connecting to the PCI Express edge connector as if it was Ethernet. Um, but they did produce reasonable looking reference clocks and the PCI Express design worked. So it's probably good. I won't know for sure until um, I get the design running on the uh, uh, the OCP NIC thing. As soon as I get one of those boards, uh, we can give that a shot. Let's see. Um, and the next thing that I'm going to be working on, now that I have all that stuff squared away, is um, the single hardware interface and some modifications to the hardware to make that work properly. Um, so the idea here is to be able to support, you know, lots of ports with uh, low overhead and basically have the software manage the hardware resources more effectively. So. There's a lot of um, components for this that are already there, and uh, we already have basically driver support for managing the resources. Now it's just a matter of uh, making this work for multiple ports, um, which should reduce the uh, the FPGA logic resources uh, quite a bit on the FPGA side. So um, there's a couple of things that are needed here. One of them is that um, I need to actually sit down and get the internal flow control working. Because if each interface is totally separate, has its own streaming interface and whatnot, then it doesn't matter if things get backed up on the streaming side. But if we have multiple ports connected to one interface, then we have to make sure we don't have headline blocking. So um, I need to sit down and get that sorted out. I have a pretty good idea how that needs to work, but just need to implement it. Um, the second thing is to rework the scheduler to support multiple ports and multiple priorities. This way we don't need one scheduler per port, but we can just have one scheduler that, you know, you can assign uh, what port and what priority level to each of the individual uh, queues. And um, and that should work as, as expected. Um, and then finally, I'm also going to look into implementing shared memory FIFOs. Uh, for the output ports. <clears throat> and the idea with that is basically to better utilize the block RAM capacity. Because right now, uh, I have sort of a stopgap module implementation that just drops down a bunch of, you know, normal AXI stream FIFOs. 
but that's not super great from a logic resource perspective when you have a bunch of uh, ports enabled. It eats up a lot of resources. Um, so yeah, if that's a shared memory FIFO, then it might fit into ultra RAM blocks or something um, which might work a little bit nicer in terms of the footprint and whatnot. And also, I guess I need to add priority support to the uh, to the FIFOs as well. So <clears throat> that's um, I'm going to be chipping away at these things uh, next probably. Um, thought I removed a couple of these slides. Okay. Um, the application section pass through. Well, now that I finally got the uh, the code pushed up to the upstream repository, um, folks at MLE can go ahead and rebase their uh, application section pass through code on top of that, and uh, we can get that all merged in upstream. So I know there's been a bit of a delay on that, but I think we're uh, we're ready to uh, to take the next step in terms of putting together a pull request so we can get that uh, that support added upstream. Um, I think that's okay. But I also have the slide here for the the shared development test bed. There hasn't really been any any updates on this front um, because I've been working on getting these some some of the other bugs squared away. But if anyone has any ideas or comments about this, um, discuss it at the last couple of meetings. But you know, happy to, happy to talk about that. I think that's yeah, and that's the end of the status update slides that I have here. So if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to uh, fire away. Yeah, maybe just a, a quick comment uh, regarding the pull request um, of yeah. the, the custom interfaces. So I just rebased and and uh, kicked off a build for our um, ZCU 102 um, reference application. Okay. And if everything runs fine, then we'll see. So I, I, the rebase was smooth anyway. All right. Well, that's good. So hopefully within the next few days, we'll have a, a pull request for that. And I'm assuming everything's going to look good because we've uh, we've done a lot of discussing on that. <laughs> yeah. And you guys have made some revisions. So yeah, that uh, probably um, should go right in and then we'll be good to go. So we we will provide um, the the reference application, and we were wondering if we should also add some documentation. So right now we we put a lot of stuff in. I think the reference application, but maybe it is a good idea to also add sections to the actual documentation. Um, um, to 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 discuss at least, at least briefly the concept and also yeah, that's, that's maybe... a good idea. Yeah, yeah. If you want to put something together for that, that would be that would be perfect. So what do you think about adding like an application more or less top level section and then um, putting everything inside because you already added like two, like the template application is already part of, of the repository and the DMA bench app as well. So then we can also have a, a brief discussion of what they do. Right. So you're thinking we add like a... Um... So we have like a folder for the applications, basically, and then we can add um, for each application, we can have a, well, okay. So I guess I guess there's two yeah. aspects. One of them is talking about the application section generally. The other one is maybe we should have some more detailed documentation for the individual applications. Is yeah, that, maybe uh, just briefly saying what they do could be just a, a little paragraph, but right now I guess it's there's no information about it. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so I do have a um, kind of a module level documentation for the uh, app block, but yeah, it might make sense to reorganize that and or add um, add some stuff talking about the applications. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I mean, so maybe we we just uh, propose something and then we can have a discussion. Right. Yeah. I mean, and so the other thing is I might as well just pull in the, the code first and then we can add the documentation because I think the code is yep. pretty defined at this point. <laughs> but the uh, the documentation, yeah, we can think about the uh, the best way to do that. Probably need to do a couple of revisions. So, yeah, I Makes guess you can do two separate pull requests, one of them for the code. We can get that in there. And then the second one, um, we can debate on <laughs> what makes the most sense for the application <laughs> stuff. Yep. So. Let's do so. All right. That sounds like a good plan. 
And there might also be an, another discussion uh, which we can have two weeks, for example, um, um, about um, um, also the interface between an application driver and the MQNIC driver. Right, yeah. Um, because we could certainly we did... add more hooks and whatnot for that. Right now, it's still a little bit yeah. sparse. So yeah, uh, so 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 stuff, some you know certainly we could we can add more stuff. Some some items kind of have been re-implemented within the application drivers, which doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, so so we 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 added uh, in the meantime uh, for for our internal development uh, custom application using the discussed interfacing to, to the external world. And we also added a, a little driver, very, very little, <laughs> and basically just a stop. But um, we, we also yeah, added some yeah, hooks into the MQNIC driver to pass resources, for example, um, other than kind of re-enumerating uh, the register layout. Um, yeah, so so we can discuss this later. So and, and then then let's let's take it step by step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, cool. I I have been thinking it would be a good idea to add more um more hooks basically for the um for the extension drivers to use. It just I haven't had time to really sit down and think about, you know, what hooks would be useful. Is there stuff that the main driver doesn't need that the application section could take advantage of? Um, but yeah, that's certainly something that we can discuss either in another meeting or in a issue or something. Um, because I, I could definitely see adding code to support the application section and the extension modules and whatnot to the main mm -hmm. device driver. So that's kind of the idea, right? If you want to extend the main device driver you might need some more hooks into it but it's just okay what hooks do we need okay we'll figure that out we can we can add that yeah makes sense all right so is there anything else you want to discuss any other questions about um and the other stuff that's been changed recently what i have one question, because you have okay. talked about the shared memory FIFUs in order to support the single hardware interface. Right. And so this implementation would be similar to the one needed, for example, to make a more efficient use of the block RAM for the ingress and egress FIFOs for the switch? Yeah, possibly, possibly. So, I, I mean, do we have, did you put together some modules for that? I mean, I know you have the shared memory kind of core switch, but um, yeah, but for the ingress I mean, and egress, this... maybe not? Uh, no, 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 not, not yet. Okay. So I don't know. Yeah. Like... So I mean, I guess we could probably use the same code or similar code for those as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it would have kind of a similar, similar capabilities as the ingress mm -hmm. and egress um, components in the switch. So. Okay. It's just to, I mean, right now I'm working more on the multicast stuff, trying to finish right. it. So. Maybe the next thing in my to-do list is to try to put some code for that, for this more efficient use of, for the support of the virtual channels and that stuff. So right. I don't know if, I mean, we will be working in parallel or do, do well, you- Well, I mean, to I need to get the, the maybe, scheduler maybe. stuff and um, the internal flow control figured out first. The I put that third on there because that is kind of the third thing out of those okay. three that needs to be done. So um, if that's something that you want to work on and we get it to a point where it's, you know, performant and resource consumption looks good, then, you know, we could certainly, okay. you know, merge that in perhaps to the uh, to the mainline, you know, NIC code base. If you wanted to go that route, we, we could certainly do that. Um, yeah. Okay. Could maybe so we can also... work on then then yeah certainly we can um discuss what that might need to look like and uh and go from there so okay yeah maybe i can start taking a look at that and maybe on the switch development meeting of next monday we can discuss some details oh yeah that's... sure i mean you also put together the the shared memory switch stuff yeah the, basically the actual shared memory the switch. core so part it's going to be similar. the same yeah yeah okay okay All right. cool.
well, we can nice. certainly discuss that in, in more detail at the next meeting and, and go from there. Yeah. Okay, nice. And then, yeah, I'm sure those modules will be uh, also used in the switch. So that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I guess speaking of the switch, um, there was also that Terabox unit. I guess you. Um, yeah, I have recently about that. Took a look. Um, yeah. Because my understanding of that is it's basically it's a it's a server. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the server. And then it has the XUP P3R card, which has a BU9 PFPGA. And then it has an extension yeah. module with um, 20 SFP plus modules. So I guess it's a question of the you know price and availability and whatnot of, of those things. But it seems like that could potentially be a decent setup for um, for what you guys are are putting together. The nice thing about having those SFP modules is you know you can actually just send them wherever you want to plug whatever you want in there, as opposed to dealing with a QSFP, if you want to break that out as 425 gig, you know, you're somewhat limited in terms of how you can do that, right? You can put a PSM4 in module in there, you can put a 850, um, but then you got to deal with breakout fibers and whatnot. If you want to send two electrically and two optically, you can't do that. So yeah, yeah, it's um, it's nice having the separate modules. Yeah, I, I think little, it's more complicated. I had a little yeah. back and forth with, with Bitware mentioned that we're working on the Switch, and they're like, well, we got the XUP VV8 with the QSFP DDs. I'm like, yeah, okay. That'd be a pain to break those out, probably. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it is a pretty high density card, right? The QSFP DDs means you have, um, I guess that would be 32 ports to 25 gig off of a single PCIe card, which that's kind of cool. But uh, with a lot, <laughs> yeah, dealing with QSFP DDs is um, not so nice. Mm. But probably I've never, I have never seen a card with QSFP DD, but I don't know if it's very complex or. Well, QSFP DD is just just eight lanes instead of yeah. four, so um, yeah, they, they don't really look any different <laughs> from the uh, from the outside, um, the the slots, but okay. um. Well, I was having a discussion with somebody on the uh, Zulip um, about QSFP DDs, and they're more complicated because of the uh, the protocols that are supported. So hmm. it seems like it's like if you get a 400 gig QSFP DD, when you power it on, it comes up in basically 400 gig mode, presumably. Because we haven't verified that yet, but okay. uh, that's that would make sense. Um, but then if you want to run it at different rates, you've got to go through a relatively complex process of basically telling it what what standards you're operating at. There's these kind of presets that it has, and you pick the preset, and then you tell it to use the preset on a particular lane or group of lanes. So it's like you, you could load the 400 gig on the first lane, or if you wanted to run it mm -hmm. as, um, as 100 gig, you know, you could put two of those in depending on the lane configuration, or you could put four of them in, or you could have a mix of 25 gig and 100 gig, or I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you have to go through the process of, of telling the module, you know, what configuration you want. Um, so extra extra hoops to jump through if you actually want to use it. <laughs> it's unlike the QSF, it's like the QSF B28s, they just kind of, it's a one-to-one -one pass through kind of thing. So um, yeah, you might need to turn the CDR in the module on or off, depending on what rate you're running at but for the most part you know it just works yeah. but it's for the QSFP DDs you've got uh, all the PAM4 modulation and whatnot and um, I guess for the 400G stuff you'll come in 8 wide at uh, 50 gig PAM4 and then you'll go out like optically at 4 wide 100 gig PAM4 so to do all that reorganization there's uh, a lot more complexity in there that's got to be managed somehow so yeah, yeah, I see. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the CMIS spec that describes the management on those things is like a couple hundred pages long. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> this is, yeah. uh, these could be a pain to work with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I guess. So for the uh, the stuff you're doing with the switch, 10 gig or 25 gig are both decent potentially, depending on what you're doing, right? You don't need yeah. 25 gig or 100 gig necessarily. It's more like 
we're going to build a switch, we might as well try to build a 100 gig switch. But um, yeah, for the actual project, 10 gig is probably fine. So yeah, yeah well, we'll have to reach out to, to Bitware about the, the Terabox units just to see what the pricing is like and whatnot, like, you know, compared to the Arista <laughs> 7132. Um, well, <laughs> Yeah, because those are definitely nice units, but I don't know what the uh, what the what the price is. They're probably not cheap. Yeah, I mean, Bitware is also very expensive, so yeah, we have to see. But Arista, yeah, right. I think. But yeah, but I think that the unit that you. But I mean, between the two, there could be a factor of ten difference or something, you know. So. Well. I don't know. Maybe maybe not that much, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, but definitely. Something like that is, I think, what in the final application that in which we want to apply all the things we are working on, yeah, it will look similar to that. Yeah. And I guess the other thing nice about that potentially is to have the you know the server CPU acting as kind of the switch management CPU. Right, like with the high tech global boards, I guess we'd have to put like a soft CPU or something on there for that role or trying to get it connected to an external device over PCIe. But um to have that all inside of one box along with management CPU, that's that's useful. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I mean it's kind of the only thing left on the HTG board. Right, yeah. Yeah, I was doing some ruminating on the PCIe thing. I think what I might end up doing for that board is to try to make a um, to spin a little board that has a pair of the um, Firefly connectors just directly connected yeah. to eight lanes of PCI Express. Um, right. That might be the most straightforward route, but uh, haven't mm -hmm. had time to you know lay something out yet. I'd have to get some of the uh, mating connectors and whatnot. So, but if that works. That uh, that would be a nice way to get eight lanes of PCI Express into those things. Yeah, it's kind of also a kind of a mini project to. Yeah, yeah. To something like that. Yeah, I guess I could put that on the the project slide as well. Hey, somebody wants to spin a board, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be cool. All right. Well, does anyone else have any questions or comments or stuff they want to discuss in relation to the status updates or just corundum generally? It's the only thing from Emily is the, um, the application section extensions, at least at this point. Yeah, at this point, I guess so. As long as Joachim doesn't have any additional items, but I think for now that's it. All right. Well, I mean, just maybe, about to maybe, ask. Maybe, uh, maybe Joachim has something, but he's uh, got to figure out how to get off a of mute first. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes this happens. <laughs> uh, uh, one of those days, right? <laughs> yeah, it's getting no, late here. <laughs> all, all good. All good. All right. <laughs> no more, no more points to discuss today from my side. <laughs> all right. All right. Sweet. Were you um, going to say something, uh, Ulrich? I've I've got a question to Quentin, I guess. Um, as long as you're still there. Yeah. Ah, great. Um, um, are, are you on Zulip already? Sorry. Uh, are you on Zulip? The Zulip uh, um, messaging. Ah, no. We have. no, no, still not uh, for the moment because, you know, uh, I I'm following this uh, this project, but uh, I have uh, I'm doing other things uh, in my uh, my work, so <clears throat> for for now I'm not really uh, in into this project, but uh, yeah, I I think I'm gonna subscribe so. That's just kind of a passive but, observer, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the point. I, I'm no problem to, at all. I'm trying to to understand uh, and uh, yeah to 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 follow not not to disturb too much. 
Yeah, no, no problem. I, I just wanted to reach out to you. So um, that that's why I'm asking if there is any any good way to to reach you. Uh, not yet, but I can share my email, or <laughs> else I can just uh, subscribe. Yeah, cool, great. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I think I just found you on the open hardware repository, ah, yeah. but there's you're, also no emails there. So you're you're on which WDR? Pardon me? You you are you are already on which uh, WDR? No, uh, we are not. Ah, okay. And I'm not, I'm not sure if we actually can get access. I think we I, can't. To be honest, I don't know. At least you wouldn't be able to push but i think you can access the code uh, because the all the documentation of the of the white rabbit switch and the, all this stuff is on a ohwr for the public to access so i guess you could uh, but I've, i can't send you a message i guess uh, until I, got, I have an account ah yeah yeah right right so okay let me uh let me go on uh it's Zul. I'll, I think... I'll just uh, send you the link real quick here. Yeah, I think. I yeah, think cool. I, I I recorded it last time. Just need. Yeah, no problem. No hurry. Uh, just would be great to to have a way to kind of yeah, get sure. in contact. There's, there's otherwise, the link. I put the link in the uh, in the chat. Sure. So... I think cool, unlike great. Zoom, you can just go. Uh, yeah, to the cool, thing and cool, sign up. Zoom, 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 uh, Zoom uh, with with Slack, you can go straight to the link and sign up. Um, or unlike Slack, <laughs> you can go straight to the link and sign up. I think Slack okay, is yeah, I, I had it. It was the invitation okay. thing. So yeah, so okay. yeah, I'm go I'm going to do it now. So it would be done. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, because yeah. I know the MLE folks have been doing a lot with um with White Rabbit, or maybe not a lot, but they've been working on a few things relating to White Rabbit. So. <laughs> Yeah, we'll exactly. Have a few questions and stuff in relation to that, and, so. and th there will be more work next year as well. So, um, kind of wanna make sure that we don't do the same thing at the same time. <laughs> or if you do, you do it in a coordinated fashion. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So. Yeah, it looks I like uh, I just saw the notification. So I guess uh, Quentin is now. On Zulip. All right, cool. So Yay, you, guys, cool. you guys can bother him that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Great. So, uh, so I, I'll ping you during your next days. There, okay. There's no rush. All right. Cool. All right. Sweet. So next meeting is, is on 8, you you, you said, uh, Alex? Right. So... um. Well, so I think the next two meetings are going to be as normal, right? So there's going to be the switch development meeting um, on the 11th, right, in a week, and then okay. another chrono developer meeting uh, on the 18th. But then the point is that uh, the next two Mondays after that are December 25th yeah. and January 1st. So those, uh, <laughs> just kind of a lo longer term heads up, um, are not going to be meetings. So I think the one after that is going to be on the 8th. Okay. But... There should be a couple more meetings but, before that. So, so there's there's two kinds of meetings, if I understand well. Right. The, yeah. The so uh, originally the Corona developer meetings, I'm like, well, every week doesn't make sense. So we'll do it every other week. Great. Um, and then with uh, Carlos working on the Switch project, it's like, well, okay, maybe we need to go into a bit more detail on the Switch stuff. So, um, well, we're doing the Corona meetings every other week, so we'll fill in the other ones with Switch. So. We basically okay. meet every week, but it's a slightly different group of people depending on you know who's interested in the NIC platform and who's interested in the in the switch that okay. uh, Carlos is working on. So, all right, if you're interested in both, uh, feel free to drop in every week. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's every Monday at the same right. uh, at yeah. the same time. Same time, okay. yeah. Okay. The figure we'll just yeah for the switch make things simple. Same time, same room, same everything. You know. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I probably uh, train. Because I guess you guys are working on a switch too, but um, yeah, I guess sure. That's why slightly why, uh, different characteristics. Could, could, so could be interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the plan with the switch that uh, that Carlos is working on is that eventually that'll support White Rabbit as well at um, at twenty five gig. So twenty five gig, ten oh. gig, uh, and if we can get the other thing that we're 
that we've been scratching our heads over is like, hey, can we take conceivers that are configured for 10G and run them at 1G, you know, without changing the PLL yeah, settings and, and whatnot? Yeah, that's, that's a question you asked uh, last time, and uh, I got the answer. I, uh, indeed, uh, we're going to to support both 1G and 10G on the, on the future version of the Switch. Right. Well, so I know you can definitely reconfigure the transceivers for 1 gig, but the question is, if you can't do that for some reason, right? If you can't use the CPLL because the ref clock is wrong and yeah. you're using the other QPLL for 25 gig, is there a way to get one gig out of there somehow? Um, yeah, using okay. Some sort of oversampling. So I think Carlos said he was going to start looking at that. Just Right. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. there's... Um, there's kind of a series of experiments I think we need to do to make sure this is actually going to work before we actually sit down and uh, and actually write a you know customized file layer and whatnot to uh, to make that work. But um, because it is kind of a funky oversampling ratio, so I think it'll work. We have pretty good confidence it'll work, but you know we got to try it and, and see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah. But yeah, so that that'll be the uh, that'll be the idea if we can support. Um, 1 gig, 10 gig, and 25 gig on all the ports on this thing, as well as support, you know, grouped 100 gig ports. Um, that would be a pretty powerful capability, I think. Okay. Be nice. Indeed. Now, I guess we are trying to support White Rabbit, but the timing is not necessarily, you know, like the number one priority. So I don't yeah. know, maybe your guys' design would be more accurate in terms of timing or something but it is it is for us in a, that's the right because what you guys right. are doing is usually the timing is not number one and then it's like oh yeah, yeah we can also send some data so that's uh, yeah yeah <laughs> nice that's, that's, side benefit that's exactly <laughs> so... what my my colleagues are thinking also <laughs> we know that the the throughput of the the current switch is not that good and it's even not tested you know with the the full uh, fully loaded i mean with food with uh, 18 ports uh, plugged and the uh, and data going in and out so we don't really know the the exact performances of the of the switch uh, fully loaded oh interesting okay <laughs> and then i guess in terms of the actual switch features and whatnot it's probably a pretty basic switch yeah it is yeah because that's, that's i guess another thing that carlos is looking at doing for some of their work is actually supporting some of the tsn features so that requires Quite a bit of additional stuff in the switch for that to work so right but we could certainly yeah. talk about yeah. that uh next week in a lot more detail at the switch development meeting when carlos can tell us about all the fun stuff he's been working on right okay yeah currently trying to support some have some kind of multicast inside the crossbar so yeah all right well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, does anyone else have any so... questions or comments or anything, or or did you want to say something, Quentin? No, no, no. I'm okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I guess we don't have all that many people connected today so um if we're out of stuff to talk about then i guess we can go ahead and adjourn it's it's like 9 50 so well we, we're, we're under time i think <laughs> last time we, we went over by like a whole bunch <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that it means there's a lot of uh, a lot of good discussion all right well um all right i guess if uh, we don't have anything else to discuss then We'll go ahead and adjourn for today, and um, we'll see all you guys next week for the Switch, or in two weeks for the Nick. All right. We'll go okay, from yeah, there. Probably right. join uh, next week. All right. Sounds Bye. good. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the meeting. <laughs> see you guys. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks Bye. everyone for uh, for tuning in. Talk to you. Okay. See you.